Welcome, everyone, and welcome to St. Paul's Howard's Grove for worship today. The focus of our service is going to be about God, meaning what is he like? How do we picture him? How are we supposed to think of him? What are, what are the dimensions of God? And the way we're going to look at him today is through the words of Psalm 139, a psalm of David, throughout our service today. May God bless you as we worship together and in joining together in our opening hymn, which is number 240. of singing that opening hymn for worship is to unite God's people together and what the theme of the service is. And now as we go forward, we come to the invocation where we call on God and the purpose of the invocation is, is to unite God's people together under the name of the triune God. We're going to meet him today and this is the same Lord we met in our baptism. And so we begin, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Merciful Father, I, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil, and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me. A sinner.
God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for all of our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority alone, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, The Lord be with you. And And also also with you. And let us pray. Almighty Lord, the shaky nature of our earthly struggles, it tempts us to doubt your nature and your characteristics. Lead us today to trust you, our God. You are all-knowing. You are present everywhere. You are almighty. And you give us not one reason to doubt you ever, even when life is tough. Instead, Lord, increase our faith to cling to you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. First lesson we have today is from Psalm 139, of course. We're jumping near the end of the psalm, beginning at verse 13. And and in this first portion we're going to look at today, it emphasizes the power of God, that it's unlimited. He is all-powerful from the beginning of our life all the way to the end of our life. We read, For you created my inner organs, You wove me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, and my soul knows that very well. My bones were not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unfinished body. In your book, all of them were written. Days were determined before any of them existed. Your thoughts to me are so precious, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I would count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. I awake, and I am still with you. This is the word of our Lord. Continue with our psalm of the day, Psalm 139.
second lesson this morning is from Psalm 139, beginning at verse 7. And here the psalmist, in looking at what God is like, he's awed by God being present everywhere, that he has no limitations in any way on his presence. And so we read, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, there you are. If I rise on the wings of dawn, I settle on the far side of the sea. Even there your hand guides me, and your right hand holds on to me. And if I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me, then even the darkness will not be too dark for you. The night will be as light as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. This is the word of our Lord. God's word that we consider this morning are the first few verses of Psalm 139, and we read, Lord, you have investigated me, and you know. You know when I sit down and when I get up. You understand my thoughts from far off. You keep track of when I travel and when I stay, and you are familiar with all my ways. Before there is a word on my tongue, you, Lord, already know it completely. You put a fence behind me and in front of me, and you have placed your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot grasp it. This is God's word. Grace and mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, your fellow believers in him. You know, once all this stuff is over and you get to travel again and you go to the local airport and you get through security and you go 
to that machine where they have you raise your hands maybe like this and they scan you. That's an x-ray scan. They're doing an x-ray scan of you and they want to see if you have anything at all on your body or on your person. Or you can go lie down at the hospital, a bed, and on this particular bed, they can pull you straight back into this big machine called a CT scan where they actually do multiple x-rays at one time for a number of minutes and it it peers inside of your body and it, it looks at your bones and blood vessels and your tissue and it looks to see on the inside if there's any damage or trauma on the inside. Or you can travel all the way over to Berkeley, California and you can go to a place called Berkeley Lab where they have a $27 million electron microscope and that microscope can peer down all the way to a hydrogen atom and it can take a picture to something half the size of a hydrogen atom. I believe that is, from my research, the, the biggest microscope in the world, or the best, that can go down that deep. So let's get this straight. You can get an x-ray scan of the outside of your body. You can get a CT scan of multiple images of a slice of the inside of your body. Or you can get an electron microscope and see something all the way down to the smallest atom. And yet, with all of those things, they wouldn't know you. They wouldn't know you don't like sauerkraut or black licorice. They wouldn't know that you're an animal lover or a people person. They wouldn't be able to tell your hopes and dreams for the future. They wouldn't be able to see the joys that, that you've already had in life. They wouldn't be able to detect and ascertain your fears and know that you really don't like tiny spiders. Or, or maybe right now you don't like being alone. They wouldn't be able to tell that when you're driving on the interstate, you don't like driving your car being sandwiched between two big tractor trailers. And maybe they can't tell that you're very terrified of, of even thinking about your own mortality. King David is somebody who lived 3,000 years ago. He lived 3,000 years ago, and he wrote this beautiful psalm, Psalm 139. Actually, let's tweak that a little bit. David prayed this psalm himself. It was his prayer, and as he prayed it, he, he noticed something incredible about God. In this prayer, he detected something incredible and spectacular about the attributes of God. And, and, and in looking at this, he said straight off the bat in his prayer, you've investigated me. Lord, you haven't done an x-ray scan of the outside of my body. You, you haven't done a CT scan of, of, of a portion of my insides. You haven't done a microscopic view down to the smallest atom of the inside of my body. You've done something even more than that. You don't know individual things. You know all of the parts of me. You know every part of me put together to the point that you know me. And it's incredible. You've peeked into my mind. And you know what I'm thinking about. And you know all of those things that I've tucked away in there. You've peered into my heart. And inside of my heart, you've seen all of those chambers and the things that I've th thought about and my emotions that I've tucked away inside of there too. You've searched my soul, Lord, and you know my personality and my passions and you know my likes and, and you know my limitations, Lord. And as you've done this investigation, the results are instant. They're immediate. And the results come in and... and and the result is, you've investigated me and you know. You know everything about me. You know all of the things in every part of me. Nothing escapes your gaze. 
you know, it's one thing for something to be a snapshot on the outside of the body or, or something to be a number of snapshots put together looking at the inside of the body or something to look at one small, small part inside the body. But God is not limited that way. He sees everything all the time. And the results that come in for God when he's looking through us and, and through all of and he understands us. The results of God are never limited either to the point where God says something like, well, you know what, I'm, I'm not sure. It, it could be, uh, my best guess is, because that's not God. God is not limited in any way. God has no deficiencies like that in any kind of way. And so when God has these attributes of knowing everything. God is never going to say to you, I don't know. And he's certainly not going to say to you, you know what? I think I'm going to get a second opinion on this. I think I'm going to have to ask somebody else for their advice. God is unlimited in his knowledge and insight into every single aspect of you at all times, to the point where even before David prayed this psalm, even before David wrote this, even before David thought these things in his head, God knew everything that he was going to say. And the same thing is for you. God knows you from top to bottom. God knows you inside and out. God knows you from bottom up. And he knows every single thing about you so that he knows you better than you could ever even know yourself. Which is why King David didn't stop with what he wrote there, that you've investigated me and you know me. He's so awed by the, the knowledge, the all-knowing nature of what God is like that he gives practical examples. He says, you know when I get up in the morning. You know when my day starts. In fact, Lord, you know on my day when I need to take a break. In fact, Lord, you know when, when, when I need to go out my front door and you know the duties that I have to do on my day and you know, Lord, when I come back from all of those things and when my day is done and when I'm exhausted and when I'm finally ready to lie down again, whether I've gotten all the things done on the day that I want to or not, I'm, when I'm ready to lie down. In fact, the verbs that are used here in the first few verses are incredible. David writes, you understand you keep track of, you are familiar with, you know it completely, Lord. It's as if God has been David's and all of our executive assistant. And he's been that way from our conception and from our birth so that he knows where all of the files and thoughts of our life are. And God is the one himself who has filed them and put them in their places. And God is the one who has kept our calendar. He knows every place we've gone, every place we've been, and every place we're going to go. It's as if God has been our tech department. As if God has detected every single keystroke from our keyboard. And he knows every single letter and number we've used. He knows the combinations we've used. He knows where those emails have gone and who we've sent them to. Oh, it's as if God, being God, is so far beyond Alexa or Siri because, you know, in order to make this work, you still have to talk to it. You still have to give it the command, hey, Siri, hey, Alexa, and you have to let it know what you want. And yet God... God is way beyond that because even before the words have come, even before you formulated the words, even before you thought the thoughts to have the words, God knows exactly what you're going to think and what you're going to say. He knows you. Which is why, which is why at times like this, at times of what we're facing in life, times of danger, times of peril, times of struggle, times of pandemic, which is why it's so appalling when people, especially God's people, investigate God in his attributes and his characteristics, and they think, and they think they have found a deficiency. It's as if we've done a scan. 
of the externals that we know about God. It's as if we put these pictures together in our human mind, and it's as if we think we have seen the inside of God and we've found fault, or that we've taken that microscopic view and we've gone way down deep into the theological things that God has said about himself, and we think we see where God is wrong. Yep, we found it. That's right. You think you know me, God? And yet you let these things happen to me in life and to, the, and to this world and you haven't stepped up? You think you know me and you know my words and you know what I'm going to say and, and yet, Lord, if that's the case, shouldn't you have the answer already in place before I even have to ask for it? You have sorted my thoughts and, and you've placed them all out and scattered them and you, you know them so well from my conception to this point in my life. And, and yet, you didn't file these certain things in my life under urgent, <laughs> under top priority, under needs, action immediately, and you let me suffer, you let me sit, you let these things go on. You know what that seems to say? That you that you are distant, that, that you can't help. And when I put all these things together, it looks to me like the answer is that you don't know me. The beautiful thing about Psalm 139 that David wrote is that the language he uses, the words that he writes, and the phrases that he uses in Psalm 139, they're actually not from his time period. The way David writes this psalm, he actually writes this using words and phrases from a thousand years earlier, and it's as if he's taken them right out of the book of Job, and he's placed and inserted these thoughts right into Psalm 139. It's as if these things are what Job had talked about and said. And they are. And Job was no stranger to hardship. Job was certainly, if you read his book, he's no stranger to difficulty and suffering. Uh, Job knew in his body. He knew what it was like to suffer. He, he knew in his heart what it was like to have loss and to suffer loss. He lost children, 10 of them. He suffered the loss of flocks and crops. He, he suffered hardship even in his marriage, losing the confidence, it looks like, even of his spouse. Job knew anguish in his, in his soul, in his mind, and, and in his spiritual life. And Job, Job did something wrong. Job took all of these things that he thought he knew about God and he lashed out at God. And he accused God of wrongdoing, finding fault with God. His faith went south and struggled. And Job took it too far, elevating himself and mankind, putting mankind on a pedestal right there next to God, thinking man deserved to be God's equal and that he had the right to challenge God. And Job sinned when he did it 4,000 years ago. And David sinned when he did it 3,000 years ago. And my friends, we sin when we do this today in our day in the challenges that we face. Do you understand that when God reveals these attributes and characteristics of himself and he tells us about his power and he tells us about his knowledge and he tells us about his presence, he, he gives us these things and these answers to us for our comfort, that he truly is God. But he, he does not reveal these things to us in such a way that now we think he owes us an answer for these things. God, you owe me an answer for how you use your knowledge. God, you are accountable to me for where your presence is. God, you owe me an answer for how you use or don't use your almighty power. 
when I think. There's something we need to keep very accurately in mind. God is still God. And we're not. We're sinful people. God owes us no answer. But every day of our life, we answer to God. And the beautiful thing today, and every day, is that God gives us the answer in our lives to give Him, to say to Him. Today is a day we're celebrating as Palm Sunday, which means in history, this is the day where Jesus Christ gets on a donkey and he rides in humility on that beast of burden and he rides on that donkey straight into his city, the capital city of Israel, to, to Jerusalem. And there are crowds gathered all around. And as he rides in, the crowd starts shouting, Hosanna, which means save now. And they start cutting down palm branches and, and waving palm branches, which, which is a picture of they recognize God has come down to save his people. And so as Jesus comes in, in humility, on that donkey, he still is all-knowing. He is present everywhere. He has all power because he is truly God in every way. And yet, as he comes in on that donkey, he comes, he comes like you and me. He comes as true man. He comes with flesh and blood and tissue and bones. And if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, if you go in your Bible and you read through those books, those are about the life of Christ. And you know what they're going to tell you? They're going to tell you exactly what happened to Christ Jesus when he got up in the morning and what he did with his day. They're going to tell you what happened to Jesus when he got tired on his day. They're going to tell you about all the things Jesus did when he left the house. And when he went out into the community, they're going to tell you all about his teachings and interactions with people. They're going to tell you all about the life of Christ and what he did when he got tired and went to bed at night. And you know what you're going to find when you read those four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Is that you are going to find this Jesus is true God and true man is the one person who existed in the history of the world who never sinned once. He never sinned in his heart, and he never sinned in anything that he did with his body, in any interaction, anywhere that he went in his life. And so here he is, true God and true man, and he's coming into this city of Jerusalem on that donkey, and the Bible today, on Palm Sunday, and every day, it begs for you to investigate him. It wants for you to look closely and deeply at him. It wants you even to evaluate the mind of God as he comes in because Jesus has the mind of God. And do you see why he's here? Do you see why he's come? Do you see why God has come to the people of that day and to the people of every day, including you and me today? He's come to be your savior. He's come to be your substitute for your sin so that you don't have to take it. He's come to Jerusalem, to his city, to indicate his willingness. I'm here and I'm willing to die a sinner's death. I'm willing to even endure death on a cross. And he did. Jesus has come to be your answer so that you have an answer when you, like David, face God in your prayers and you know you can face him knowing that you are forgiven. Jesus has come to be your answer so that when that day of mortality and death comes, when you stand before your maker who has all power as God, when you stand before him and you see him face to face, that Jesus Christ is your answer. That God is going to let you into heaven because your sins truly are forgiven. You see, through Jesus, you get to know God. You get to know Him. You get to see the heart of God that He loves people, that He wants to forgive sinners, and He does in Jesus Christ. 
you get to see the mind of God that he brought all of his attributes together, his knowledge, his presence, and his power. And he brought all these things together in the person of Jesus Christ so that Jesus is here to save and to save and rescue people like you and me. Otherwise, he wouldn't be here. And yet here he is today on Palm Sunday. Here he is to help. Here he is for you. Here he is to forgive. Here he is to take your place. Here he is to show you God's love is real. And here he is to save. Job, through the promises of God, saw that 4,000 years ago. David, through the word of God, saw that 3,000 years ago. And today, through Psalm 139, and with Palm Sunday, you get to see just how deeply God knows you and loves you. And through Jesus Christ, you get to know him. All of this. When David thought about this, the way God worked, who God was, what God was like, and what he was willing to do for sinners like him and, and sinners like us. It was incredible how God places his hand on us, how he fences us in in a protective kind of way and takes care of us in our spiritual lives, in our earthly lives even. That David summed this all up with the words, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. I cannot grasp it. And that's true. But he believed it. And by grace, so do we. Trust in the Lord always, at all times, in every way, no matter what the circumstances are, that God is your God. And He knows you. And through Jesus, you really do know him. Amen. For our offering, you are able to contribute as God would have you in love for the Lord and in love for what he's done for you. You can contribute in a variety of ways. You can use PayPal and find us as a charitable, uh, charitable organization on PayPal. You can mail something in or you can stop by the office this week during open hours and you can drop something off. And we thank you very much for your support of the ministry here at St. Paul's. And we continue with prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, today you came to present yourself ready and willing to save even by going to a cross. Lord Jesus, save us. Save your people. Save us from our sins. Deliver us from all of our doubts. Take away all of our fears with your word and with the work of your life and by the power of your gospel. Let your peace fill our hearts and lives. Then comfort us with your knowledge, with your presence, and with your power. You really do know us, and by grace, we know you. And so, Lord, come to the help of your people. Since you know all things, you know the names of those who have lost loved ones and recently this past week. You know the names of those whose businesses are struggling. You know the people who are hurt now so deeply in their soul and need help, your help. Those who are lonely, those who are sick, those even whose faith might be failing, or those whose bodies need medical attention. Help them all, Lord. And we also ask that you would continue to help our country and our community, especially to know you. We pray this in your holy name as we now join in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read and learn and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, 
we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. God omniscient, God unknowing, in his wisdom does ordain every working of creation to the glory of his name. Who his thoughts can dare to fathom, who his judgments can contain, none his equal, unassailable. We are God who will. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for worship today. So thankful you could be with us today, and we'd love for you to continue uh, staying with us and continue with our ministry going forward. A couple of announcements that I'd like to share with God's people for today, for ministry that's going on here. Uh, this morning, Sunday morning at 9.30, there is online Bible study through the Zoom link, and you can go to our website to find that. But on Easter, there will not be morning Bible study, and, and during Holy Week this week, we're not going to have online Bible studies either. Uh, there are going to be regular worship services for Monday, Thursday posted on our YouTube page. Worship services for Good Friday posted there as well. And you'll find Easter as well on our YouTube site. So no online Bible studies after Sunday. And while it's, we don't know quite yet, for the end of the month we have a voters meeting scheduled on the last Sunday of the month. We're hoping we can still meet together as uh, these restrictions, God willing, may be lifted and they might not be. So worst case scenario, if we can't meet for our voters meeting, we'll have to reschedule that. But our council is still planning to get all of the documents together for the voters meeting packet of information and we plan to email that information out to you or to have hard copies available that 
if you stop in at church, we're able to get you some of that information as well. Lastly, communion schedule for this week. If you're interested in, in uh, participating and joining in the Lord's Supper, the communion days that pastors are going to be available will be Tuesday of this week as well as Friday of this week. And I'll be handling both of those. So if you would just give me a phone call or a text message on my phone, we can, we can negotiate what times are available and go from there. Those are the announcements I have. May the Lord continue to bless you today and every day and bless your holy week in our Savior, Jesus Christ. God's blessings, everyone. Take care.